She's the long-lost daughter of country music icon Hank Williams and has worked tirelessly to promote his legacy. Our guest is Jet Williams on the VVN Music Podcast. Hi, and welcome to episode 44 of the VVN Music Podcast. I'm Roger Wink, and this week we have an archive interview with Jet Williams, the daughter of Hank Williams. Jet was born just five days after Williams died at the age of 29. Given up by her birth mother, she traveled through the foster system, and it wasn't until the early 80s that she decided to research her birth parents and found out that she was the daughter of a country icon. It then took a court fight for her to be recognized as one of Hank's heirs. In 2011, Jet was instrumental in the release of the 16-CD box set of Hank's radio shows for Mother's Best Flower, which was broadcast on WSM in Nashville. While many of the shows were never recorded, 72 15-minute broadcasts were put on acetate for use while Williams was on the road. Those acetates were used for the box set, which sees Williams not only singing many of his hits, but covering other songs of the day and making many forays into gospel and religious songs. Congratulations on the Grammy nomination. Oh, man, I tell you what, I am, I am still uh, flying. I went to the, uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, each uh, area has a, a chapter of Grammy, like New York, and, and Nashville had the, their party uh, this past Tuesday which I went to, and it was absolutely fantastic. And it was kind of like a, I think more like a pep rally of everybody from from the country music Nashville area being there, you know, kind of uh, congratulating. And, it, and it's really amazing the numbers overall uh, of how many people from uh, country music Nashville are nominated for Grammy. You got the chance for nominations not only from the country awards, but you got spread out over Americana, the historical, and even into some of the pop categories. There are a lot of nominations this year. And uh, like I said, it was really like a pep rally because everybody was, you know, I mean, the spirits were really high and, you know, uh, a lot of hugs and kisses and high fives and everything. There was a lot of pride there Tuesday night. I'd have, I'd have to say that. You know, the only thing I was disappointed with was that it didn't get a nomination in the Best Package category for that fantastic old-style radio box. I, I, well, I, I told somebody, they, they were asking me this the other night, and I said, what if I had had my, my, my wishes, I was really hoping for, the, the, of course, the historical, the packaging, and the box set. Then, then, then I told someone, I said, you know, but if you had to pick one, the packaging and the box sets are cosmetic. What what the historical is, I think it includes packaging box set. It's part of the the whole equation, but it's what is in that box set and that packaging that is is the music blood blood. It's an amazing album from a historical standpoint and the way it's built up the known repertoire of Hank. But you know, it's also important, at least I think, that it could be used in college classes on the history of radio and broadcasting because I think a lot of people don't realize how. Radio at that time used a lot of 15- and 30-minute shows done live in the studio with live music. I think it works really well from that historical standpoint, too. You, you know, you're absolutely right, because you have got to have a radio voice. Because all people hear on the radio is your voice. They can't see your facial expressions or whatever. And there was an interesting point brought up that most people listen to the radio by themselves. You know, like you're either in your car or or in the olden days, most of the time it was, you know, you turn the radio on in the barn or in the kitchen or whatever. I mean, there were a few where you sat around there and you listened to the shadow. But for the most part, you know, it was, it, it was a very intimate radio between who was on the radio and who was listening. And I did do an interview with the college, and it was really interesting um, to where the it was a communications uh, broadcasting class that called. And, of course, they put me on a speakerphone and everything. And then the student asked me questions about uh, the Mother's Best radio shows. And, and it was really interesting to hear the students have, and they were all prepared. Uh, you know, the, the teacher had called and said that they, they were going to give this seminar and would I, you know, basically be a, a telephone uh, uh, person. 
And so it, it, it went really well, but, but you're absolutely right. I do believe that, uh, I mean, this thing is historical and it is, it is by far the best. I mean, you know, when I heard old radio shows, I thought, good Lord, it's going to be scratchy and oh, you know. And what people don't realize is that when we did the transfer, we did little if anything at all to, to these other than when you have 72 shows, you know, you want to make sure that when you go from one show to the other show that, that you try and keep it as consistent as possible without, you know, that drop and, and everything. So I thought what, what on the fidelity they say is better than the MGM Masters. And so, you know, we're just so proud of it. I was going to ask you if you had to do a lot of cleaning up because I did notice in listening some of the shows were near perfect, but then there were a few like the Aunt Jemima audition, which were a little more scratchy, but that may have come from a slightly different source. Well, you know, the thing, the thing, about, the thing about transferring, I'm like, okay, the agitator, which you know is like a metal disc. So when, we were, when we were, they were transferring, some of them, we actually got a group of people and we just asked people to sit in there and, and let their ears hear because they would play like with one gauge needle and then change the needle because, you know, each acetate had to have, you had to try and pick the best needle for the way it actually grooved out. You couldn't just use the same needle on every single one of them. Some of them were deeper and some of them were a little bit more shallow. And then, you know, as far as cleaning the acetate, and then some of these had been transferred back in, I think, the 70s to a reel to reel, which then had to be baked, and then uh, uh, we played them and got some of the some of the recordings off of it. So it was a it was a painstakingly uh, labor of love, as I said, with little or no, uh, you know, maybe we tried to take out some pops and hisses, but but didn't use any kind of technology, and we tried to leave as much in there. If you're really listening hard, you'll hear people, you know, <clears throat> call for you know, be talking in the background or moving. And, and so we tried to leave it as if it was just as live and uh, pure and intimate as if it came out over that radio that day. That's how you make it a true historical document. You want it to be as much as it was on the day of recording. And the same thing with leaving the mistakes in there, you know, uh, where, where, you know, my, the band starts in the wrong key or my dad sings the wrong song. I mean, they're few and in between, but... Uh, you know, I think that that also gives it such a character. And the other thing I think to me, uh, as his daughter and uh, as a Hank fan, this gives his fans and the world a chance to get to meet the guy Hank. And you find out that he's not, you know, if you listen to the Misfinners and you believe everything you heard about him or you read about him, I mean, he was the loneliest, saddest, uh, drinkingest, uh, forlorn fellow you'd ever want to meet. And here, at 7.15 in the morning, he is as sharp as a tack, he's laughing, he's telling jokes, he's, he, he's an MC. he's a, uh, a backup singer, I mean, you know, he, uh, he, he takes his show and, and pedal to the metal, you can hear how quick his wit is, you know, how sharp his mind is, uh, and it really gives you, a, a, you know, two or three more dimensions of this guy, Hank Williams, than just this one that... that unfortunately, people want to, you know, uh, romanticize about. I know you yourself had a long court battle with getting your name officially brought in with thanks. And there was another court battle that went along with the acetates. Which is kind of funny because I always say, you know, lost daughter, lost recordings. Both of us are found. Junior and I fight each other. Hank Jr. and I fight together. When you started the whole court battle with the acetates, were you working together with the rest of the Williams family? Yes, uh, just Hank Williams and I. I mean, Hank Jr. and I. And uh, what happened, um, a bootleg copy had gotten out years ago, before I even got the acetate, before they were given to me. And we, uh, my, when I say we, my husband, who's the attorney for the estate of my father, uh, we were notified that someone was getting ready to do an infomercial and release a bootleg copy. And with that, uh, Hank Jr.'s lawyers joined my husband which these are the same lawyers we had basically uh, fought against before, but we all joined forces together, and we uh, put an injunction against them to stop them. And then Hank Jr. and I sued this company out of Texas, and then we ended up having to sue Polydor and Polygram, which was, the, at that time, the uh, record company that had our father's master con recording contract, and they said that they owned these recordings. 
Did that go all the way to the Supreme Court? Of Tennessee. What happened was we, Hank Jr. and I won at, at the lower court, the, like the circuit court. And the other uh, defendants, uh, Polygon and the company, they appealed it to the uh, Tennessee Supreme Court. And we won, and then we prevailed at, at that level. And then um, at that time, then uh, what happened basically, we were given what, you, what I would call a clear title of ownership to the recording. And here's something that, you know, people don't really realize. Say you find something in the attic, okay? Well, you may own that physical tape or acetate, but you the, you do not own what is on that. The recording, it belongs to that person that recorded it or to their state. You cannot commercially exploit something even if you have physical possession of the acetate. If someone else had these acetates, they cannot commercially exploit them. They, they, they can look at them all day long and they can play them, but they cannot actually then say, well, I own it so I can do with it what I want. Well, that's the way it should be, too. I think you're starting to see in the music business as the big companies start to lose their influence over everything. Uh, you're seeing a lot more releases from different artists as far as archived live concerts, things that you know may not have felt they had the right to do 20 years ago. Exactly, and you know, as you're right, because the... Um, uh, and that was one of the things in this lawsuit is that basically Polygram also tried to use a thing what they call blocking rights, which is, it doesn't, there is no such thing. But it's basically, you know, what that was was to say, you can't do that because it's going to hurt what I've got. They've got my dad singing Cold Cold Heart. Hank Jr. and I've got our dad singing Cold Cold Heart. And they say, you can't use your version because I've got the master and that will hurt myself. Well, you know, now we say, well, the court says we can do with it what we want. So, you know, uh, if, say, somebody wants to use any of the songs we have for commercials, then they, you know, you've kind of got a little uh, competition. When you actually had the rights to the acetates and were working on putting the whole package together, did you have to get into a lot of other rights acquisitions because of doing songs from other writers? Uh we well, uh, okay when we were putting it together and everything. Then we what we did was we contacted all of the uh, the publishers and everyone and got and got a license agreement to release all of this. For most of these people, you know, for most people, it's called the music business, you know, and it it behooves people to agree to have their material uh, released because it, it makes you money and it gives you recognition. And so, no, there was, uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, everybody, uh, of course, a lot of those songs were PD, too. I realized that there were a lot of traditional and much older songs, but I know there were also a few songs, at least, that were popular at that particular time by other artists and that he was covering just for the show. Uh, right, and, you know, that, that also tickles me, too, when you can hear him do Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain, you know, and uh, I think, you know, to be able to hear, uh, and I think that's one of the very best versions. I've, uh, I've ever heard anyone say. I was listening to that the other night, and there's an emotion in his voice that really came through. I was talking to Tony Brown, uh, actually Tuesday night, and he, he had come out and I had played these for him way be, you know, in the, in the beginning of the process, and I reminded him of what he said to me that night. And he said, of course, you know, he produced uh, Reba McIntyre and Books and Duns and Trisha Yearwood and everybody, but he sat out here and he was listening to it, and he said, you know, Jed, he says, I've always heard Hank Williams, but I, I don't think I ever really listened to him, you know. And I think a lot of us through the years have just heard that, you know, hey, good looking song or, you know, and you hear it and you just heard it, but you never really stopped and sat down. And, and, and Mother's Death actually makes you sit down, close your eyes and take a deep breath. And I mean, uh, everyone that's heard, you know, maybe his biggest fan or whatever, but you have people... I have listened to this, and, and, and all over the world, people are saying, my God, this is unbelievable. As far as you know, are there any other recordings of Hank that haven't made it to the marketplace for, you know, example, studio tapes with different takes of his songs? Uh, as far as I know, not that, but we do have a, uh, a live uh, concert, and we also have some of the uh, Hank and Hezzy. Uh, and then I have a, I ha and I have yet to play it, which will be interesting. I have an acetate that Bob Helton gave me, who was a, a dear friend of my father's and uh, very involved with him. And, and they had cut something in this kitchen on this acetate thing. So I looked for it. Uh, we were going to go to the Hall of Fame to, um, you know, because a lot of these things, though, you got to be very careful because sometimes you only get the one play out of it. 
but but there there, there are things. But as far as I know, there, there's not any studio because uh, the problem, uh, you know, thank God these went to acetate. Had these been on tape. They'd have just been recorded over. And that's what they did in the old days is they just recorded over on the same tape. You know, that's a problem not only with radio, but also with TV. A lot of the early television shows are gone for exactly that reason. Exactly. So so a lot of that in the studio stuff, I'm sure they just said, well, let's just take another retake and, and back it up. These acetates, you know, because, because of uh, what they're made of, you, you know, they survive. So we were very fortunate as much got put on those as, 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 as we did. On the DVD section of the set, I noticed that you kept referring to the late Don Helms as Uncle Don. Did you get really close with the rest of the band? Oh, yeah. Well, Uncle Don and Uncle Jerry. Uh, I met them, uh, I think it was like about 1987. And then uh, I, I joined up with Don and Jerry. And we went out on the road from 1989 and, until... Uh, Jerry Rivers uh, got sick and, and had liver cancer, and then, and then, so Uncle Don could, you know, uh, needed to. The, the long road trips were too hard on him. So I, I mean, I, I spent a tremendous amount of time on the stage with them, off of the stage with them, and I mean, they really, truly. Uh, I mean, I consider them my uncles. I mean, we uh, we shared a lot of. Uh, uh, they shared a lot of. Uh, stories and memories uh, of their time with my dad, and I got to make a lot of memories with them. It kind of sounds like you might have the makings of another book. Oh, absolutely. And then, and then the other uh, first gentleman, uh, Uncle Bill Lister, he was such a kind of a treasure trove that I don't. I think that was overlooked through the years because I mean he spent that eight months with my dad, and and you know that. Uh, time i mean he had a lot more uh, stories to tell than i think that anyone ever um you know thought because a lot of times on these uh in the past i've noticed it's the same people being interviewed telling the same story you know and uh i thought that uh big bill brought in a whole uh fresh air of of everything and in fact uh to get back to don I know how emotional he got on the tape, but I, I, I believe that when he walked out that he knew that was the last interview he was ever going to get. I mean, I know in my heart, uh, because cause that's, that's the last time I saw him. It wasn't really that long after that interview that he passed. And I think what happened was when, when he started to break, really break down, was that he knew this was, this is, this is the end. And this is, you know, and, uh, you know, and that was really, I mean, that was, I mean, I tell you what, uh, that whole place, uh, that interview uh, was just uh, very emotional. And, I, and I'm glad that, uh, Time Life, uh, uh, actually I think it was, uh, Sam's, uh, you know, Walmart Sam's company, one that actually I think is, and I may be wrong, I think they're the ones that asked, uh, uh, for something, uh, yeah, and what we thought was, you know, why not try and find the people that were actually there when this took place? You know, as opposed to, you know, that that, that, that would be a lot, you know, more personal for people to see the engineer and to, to see the a band member and see the, you know, a regular guest and hear it, hear it through their, their eyes and ears and hearts. I was thinking the other day that it seems it's time for a new biopic of Hank's life. Is there any talk of, at all of doing that? Yeah, actually, there's two movies. One of them, is, is, is already made, and it should come out this, this year, and the name of the movie is called The Last Ride. It, it, it's, uh, I'd say 95% fact, well, no, well, I can't give a statistic. Uh, it's an, it's an interest. it's really, a, it's, I love it. Okay, I, I've been given a preview of it, of the husband and I. Uh, in the movie, I'm just going to tell you this, okay, uh, they never mention the name Hank Williams. He never sings, and he never strums the guitar. Now, that sounds just as strange as it can be. But w- w- what it is is the guy that's playing my dad is traveling under an assumed name, and so you know who it is. But, but it is one of the best movies I've seen, and I can't remember when. Now, Hank Jr. and I have signed with uh, Mark Abraham and Universal Studios to actually do more like a biopic movie. And, we're, and we are uh, in the, uh, when we say we, they're in the process of getting the script completed to that part. And the one, this other one, I think, as they said, we'll only seed the clouds for the for the other movies. But it, it be on the lookout. It's called the Last Ride, and it's the last seventy-two hours of my dad's life. And it is it is 
just really great. I mean, I can't tell you how great I think it is. Right, and the young man that plays my dad is Henry Thomas, the guy that played E.T. If you go look at him, he actually kind of looks like my dad. Yeah, no, it, it it's one of these ones that'll either, uh, I just think it'll catch on, you know. I mean, because the thing that it is, it has so many, you know, even though you're looking at it, and once you start thinking about it, it's so, like, they're doing this one thing where, um, they're, you know, the, they're in the Cadillac and they're trying, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to get to the shows and stuff, so they're trying to, you know, move everything along, and they end up getting behind on a back road behind a, a truck of pigs. So here's the Cadillac, okay, and, and you got the pig, and you're looking at the rear ends of the pigs, okay, and you know they're onking, and you know my the guy playing my dad's having a fit. The driver's trying to get around them, and they're playing on the sunny side of life. It just cracks me up. I mean, but it's all these little double uh, entendres that are working through the movie that that are just so clever, you know, and and it shows you what a and it, and you see a, a, a real personal side of of my dad. I'll have to keep a lookout for that one. It would be good to see a straightforward biopic of your dad, too, because things are done a lot different today in film than in the 60s when Your Cheating Heart was released. Right. That was a disaster. But, there's, but the other thing, too, Keith and I, my husband and I, we call ourselves, we try and be the Hank uh, Truth Squad. And like when we told the, 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 the biopic people we were working with, we said, if you will just tell the truth, just tell it the way it happened. Here's the thing. I said, my dad memory uh, and his legacy deserves a true biopic that because if people come in and do this when people see it on television or they see it in the movies they believe it you know that, that, you, God, I, you know human nature whatever I said so you know we've really tried to you know stand on the um, on the you don't need to spin it that way or spin it that way just tell it like it is because I mean uh, I mean his story is fascinating you know, I mean, to be such a shooting star across uh, life thing and, and, and to accomplish what he did in such a short window. And, you know, uh, I, I was able to receive the Pulitzer Prize for him this past May, talking about William Faulkner, you know, Ernest Hemingway, you know, and he well deserved, you know. And I'm just thrilled to death that uh, the committee, uh, you know, uh, honored him with that, that award. You know, I also wanted to get a chance to talk to you about your music, too. Honk was your third album, right? Yes, and in fact, I've just gone in and I've cut, I'm cutting a new album and I'm going 360. I've gone back to bare bones, traditional country music, just the fiddle, the steel, uh, even the drums are on brushes. In fact, in the, in the, in the, the music that I'm doing now is you, you more feel the drums than you hear them. And I'm going back to more of the traditional, uh, deep country sound, uh, and, uh, and I think that with, with the tone of my voice, that's where I need to be, uh, and, and not as much into the, uh, I would say Hank's more kind of a commercial uh, type uh, produced album. I've decided, my husband and I decided, I, I decided, you know, I've listened to what everybody says, and, you know, I think I just want to go do what I like to do, and so I decided I'm going to do it myself. And I think, I, and, and actually... I did record some stuff and wrote some stuff, and that movie, The Last Ride, called, and they took some of those songs and they're putting it into the soundtrack. That, that, I think that was an indicator to me that that's where I need to be. I know on the albums you try and do a couple of Hank Williams songs. Do you write most of the other music? Yes, I do. And then on the, my dad's stuff, what I tried to do is just put a little bit different interpretation on it as opposed to trying to do it. You know, just in that, you know, as a, you know, from beginning to end is the same. But uh, as I said, I, I'm I'm just going back more to the uh, uh, basics. And in fact, the movie, The Last Ride, uh, they asked me to write, and I wrote two songs. And actually, they had the movie made. Then after I saw it, they asked me would I do something for it, and I said yes. And they said, would you uh, write a song for it? And I said fine. And I had some extra time in the studio, and I'd written another song, so I recorded it. And they took. Both of the original songs and are putting them in the movie. So, you know, as I said, that too makes me feel uh, like I'm on the right track uh, in, in the right direction musically. I wanted to ask you what your feelings are about current Nashville and, and country radio as it is. Well, here's the thing. Uh, actually, I think right now, in my opinion, I think that country music is starting to show some promise for a change. 
in the fact that I'm li- listening to like Zach Brown and, and Jamie Johnson and, and and I'm not I'm not I'm hearing I'm hearing the voices and so long for some reason uh, country music along with all other music seemed to become visual. People started wanting to see their artists, you know, whether they were swinging out on stage, fireworks, busting guitars, you know, dancing, and and having the uh, real slick, uh, you know, uh, uh, good-looking guy, great-looking girl, and let the technology uh, do all the work for their voices. To where that's why I think when when you use all of that technology and pitch machines and all that, that's how come it all sounds the same because it's it's it's, it's being mechanical. To where you take what I'm saying, I'm hearing the promise now is uh, Miranda Lambert. These people are coming in and they are really they're, they're they're instead of you know going more to the rock pop thing, they're going. I think I think I see a little bit more shift back. Uh, not quite as much as I like, but we don't want to do it too fast. But I'm really seeing it. I feel like the brakes have been put on, and and they're starting to go back and, and get some of that 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 really gritty, uh, you know, uh, singers in there, uh, females and males. And I and I, I don't, and I really do feel like I'm I'm seeing a bit of a change. People are listening to these singers. You know, they're not they're not. It's not a. Uh, it's more of a a big huge production show, or the songs are are. are Overproduced. It's, it's getting back to that, and I think uh, because uh, you know, just being out or whatever, I'm like hearing uh, people saying, "Yeah, I'm listening to so and so and so and so," and I'm, I'm looking at a real age group here. You know, not just you know, uh, 18 to uh, 30. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm hearing like even your older folks are saying, "Boy, yeah, he's really got that. He's got that good old voice." and and I think, I, and I really do think that, that I, I see, I, I, I think we've hit that point that we're, that it's starting to turn. The Mother's Best 2 uh, has been, uh, I think, instrumental too because a lot of people are getting to hear this kind of music and they say, God, that's, that's what I want to be listening to. And I don't know if you know this, but I have a radio show on Sirius XM and uh, it airs on Sunday uh, and then loops on Wednesdays and Fridays. And I host, it's called Hank in the Box. And what what we do is I host the, the hour and I play the some of the shows in their entirety. And I talk about, tell the, the listener about the songs, what was going on, what was going on in the country during that time. And we're going to also start uh, in the next batch, which I'm working on, um, is taking reviews that, mm-hmm. that have come in from you know, different people, different publications, and start weaving that in there. And then also to uh, taking the email comments and uh, everything that we're getting, the feedback of what, you know, people are listening and hearing it or they bought it, and, you know, start putting that into the show, uh, saying, you know, uh, Susie out in Dallas uh, wrote us the thing, and, and, and her favorite song is this, and, you know, whether it's 2011 or, or 1951, you know, but, but but kind of you know start you know doing all that in it and and it's gonna uh, it'll be uh, it's a year show on X Series XM but uh, I'm just real pleased that they thought enough based off of an, of an interview I gave and listening um, to the you know to the material to say we want to be a part of this and we want we want to help share this uh, music and legacy of Hank Williams. I do think that it's great that we have something like Sirius XM where there are stations dedicated to an older style of country that can't be heard on any other station over the air. You know, people are able to go and hear some of the older sounds and get some influence from them. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because, I mean, when you get into uh, to the Roadhouse and these, I mean, this is this is what people, you know, uh, the George Joneses and, I mean, you know, the Merle Haggards and the Willie Nelsons, what Bill all tells you. You know, and then and then you've got the next generation that's going to them. Well, just keep going back to the headwaters, you know, and 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 and, and you will, you know, you will be able to find that, and then be able to to get your own style, and uh, you know, be able to sing with 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 with, with that it factor. That's what makes it. That's what makes somebody good and somebody great is the it factor. Well, thank you for all your time and all your insight. Oh no, listen, just thank you for your interest, and you know, like I said, I'm real excited and. We're just pleased that we did get the Grammy nomination, and I am truly hoping that uh, you know we will get it for the historical album. But my dad did get uh, the Hall of Fame Grammy for 2010 for Lovesick Blues.
Are you going to be in Los Angeles for the awards? Oh, you bet you. This hillbilly's hit, going right on out. I was talking to Ricky Skaggs and, and Connie Smith and, and Marty and all of us. We said, hey, they better get ready, baby, because here we come. Well, good luck. I really do hope that it wins. Well, I, I do too, but if not, you know, the thing about it is it's just getting the nomination. You know, that right there uh, is one of the, the you know, the, the, when, you, when you have the industry say, hey, you, you're in the top. That's great. Hank Williams' Mother's Best Recordings are available from Amazon and through Time Life. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of the VVN Music Podcast with Tommy Victor of the Rockers Prong. Remember that you can hear the VVN Music Podcast via iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Libsyn, and the VVN Music website. For the latest news on the veteran artists of rock, pop, soul, country, folk, and blues, go to vvnmusic.com. If you have any comments or questions about the website or this podcast, please send them to vvnnetwork at gmail.com. The VVN Music Podcast is heard every week except for the months of June, July, and August when a new show is released every two weeks. Our theme music is by Yahar. This interview was originally recorded on January 20th, 2011, and this program was released on July 10th, 2017. The VVN Music Podcast is a production of the VVN Network, copyright 2017.